Hello, I'm Jenna Butler, and today I'm going to be presenting research looking at the challenges and gratitudes of software engineers during the COVID-19 pandemic. I work at Microsoft Research and study developer productivity and well-being. My co-author, Sonia Jaffe, is at Microsoft as well in the office of the chief economist. In the book, Measure What Matters, Sundar Pichai says that he measures his life as before the telephone and after the telephone. Growing up in India, he didn't have much technology, and when the telephone arrived at his house, it changed everything. For us, we have a date kind of like that too. Here in America, Microsoft sent us home March 4th, 2019. Probably a lot of you have a date similarly, as Google and other companies began to tell people it was time to work at home. Now, at first we thought this would be short-lived. I know at Microsoft, we were told it would be two weeks and we'd be back to the office. That's not exactly what happened. Shortly later, we realized that the whole world was going to change. And for us, we'd be measuring the world as before COVID-19 and after COVID-19. When this happened, every company wondered, is this productive? Can we maintain this? How is this going to work? It was a worldwide natural experiment and we wanted to learn as much as we possibly could during this difficult time. So what I did was I set up a study to examine how software engineers were doing when working from home during this time. Using one large organization inside Microsoft, we set up a study to one, measure daily satisfaction of our software engineers during the COVID-19 work from home pandemic, to understand the major challenges of this period, to understand what people were grateful for and hopefully share this information out and encourage people, and to improve the well-being by encouraging daily gratitude reflection. The way we structured this study is that we first enrolled people the first full week that we were home. At this point, we thought the study would be two weeks long. People registered by providing a made up username in order to keep anonymity. People made usernames like raining in Seattle or lady 007. They also provided demographic data, such as if they had previous work from home experience, what coding language they worked in, what team they were on, etc. After they were registered, they got a daily diary study that looked something like I'll show you in the next slide. We had an organization of more than 2,000 people, and we asked them to provide their satisfaction, challenges, and gratitudes. There were also bonus questions each week to provide additional insights. This is the nightly survey that they got. They typed in that anonymous username so that we could follow people over the course of the pandemic and see their ups and downs using this username. They rated their satisfaction. They had to say what the hardest part of their day was and what they were most grateful for. And then there was always an option to add anything else they wanted to add. Now the hardest and the grateful were required so that we could measure the difference between people who skipped the question and people who actually had nothing to be grateful for or had no hardest part. They had to say none for that section. Overall, we had many people enrolled in the study, over um, 300 people, and seven people completed 45 plus diaries in the first 10 weeks, so almost a diary every single day. We had 148 people complete 10 or more diaries, so on average of one per week. And in total, we had more than 4,000 diaries submitted. The methods that we used were each week, we looked at all the questions and used a thematic analysis to code them. We did open coding and we settled on a group of 18 codes in total. To validate our codes, Dr. Margaret Story looked over a random selection of 200 codes. She agreed with most, finding only two that she was unsure of and none that were obviously incorrect. We looked at satisfaction from week seven through 10. Initially, we were asking people to rate their productivity, but we changed that at week seven. Our interest was in their well-being and their satisfaction with work, and we were, didn't want productivity to look like we were trying to punitively measure how well they were doing during a time that was very difficult in the world. And so we only can report on week seven to 10 of their satisfaction. However, as you can see, many people were satisfied or found it better to be working from home, but a non-trivial number of people, 300 in fact, said that they were dissatisfied or it was worse working from home. And this is what has played out across many different research studies during the pandemic. People are loving it, some people, and others are really struggling. And some people go back and forth between those two, you know, on a weekly or even a daily basis. So for those people who are really struggling, we wanted to understand what those struggles were. So we coded the challenges and I've summarized them here in two week increments. Early on, the number one challenge was the internet and remote connection. 
since we were getting this data every night and analyzing it at least on a weekly basis, we saw early on that our engineers had serious issues with connecting to their remote dev computers. To address this, the organization said that people could get the fastest internet they needed in order to be productive. And we also had developer teams work on a new way to connect to remote machines that helped decrease the amount of times connection was dropped. And so as you can see over time, this greatly dropped. By week three, it was almost half, and it was um, less than 6% of the reported challenges were in this domain by the end of uh, the 10 weeks. Other challenges that started at the beginning was workspace. So in the first two weeks, people thought that this was going to be two weeks. And so we have verbatims of people talking about how they didn't want to set up a workspace since it was only going to be two weeks. Once we realized it was going to be longer, Microsoft said that we can bring home things like our chairs or our desk or our monitors or whatever we needed to make our workspace more comfortable. And as you can see, there was a bit of a decrease in people reporting this. One of my favorite parts of this study is getting to read what people actually said. And so throughout this presentation, I'll be sharing some verbatims with you. These are answers to the question, what was the most challenging part of your day that were coded as involving workspace issues? Someone said, having a dedicated workspace and being able to concentrate on meetings with a screaming one-year-old. <laughs> and someone else said, had back-to-back -back meetings. I don't have a proper seating arrangement, so I had back pain later in the day. I have a spare room, but don't want to convert it to office for temporary reasons. If this goes long, I might have to set up home office. I think we all know what happened there. Other issues were fairly consistent over the 10 weeks, such as struggling with children at home, struggling with the ability to focus, and having too many meetings. In fact, too many meetings stayed very consistent over the 10 weeks, and as long as the study has been running, continues to be a problem. Some of the verbatims for children in focus include, I was trying to solve a minor kid emergency while having a one-on-one -on -one with my manager. Or being in close proximity to family means that whenever wife is having trouble with our two small children, I have to decide whether to ignore it or stop working to engage the situation. That constant work of the brain of deciding where am I, which situation should I be in, really can lead to a drop in productivity and is something very difficult to manage. And this last quote I really like, staying focused through kid-related distractions, trying not to eat all the Easter candy in the house, feeling engaged in meetings given that my video is not working. This was last year, and it's funny that Easter just came around again, and I too am trying not to eat all the candy. For too many meetings, we saw verbatim such as, no breaks with 10.75 hours of back-to-back -back video calls. Another person said, so many meetings, all while navigating childcare challenges exhausting. And then this very last quote, I'm drowning in meetings and work and I'm falling so far behind. Now some challenges emerged and I think those verbatims could give you a hint as to what they would be. As you can see early on, very little people had anything related to being overworked, but by week five, feeling overworked or burnt out skyrocketed as one of the top complaints, as did challenges with people's physical and mental health. I think initially in the pandemic, at least here in America, there was a bit of a feeling that people were suddenly going to get a bunch of projects done and we'd be eating only organic home baked bread. And we realized quickly, fairly quickly, that just getting by during this difficult time was going to take most of our energy. Some of the verbatims that were coded as feeling overworked include being back at work in the evening with a long list of things still to do at 930 at night. Hard to keep up with one-on-ones and other meetings, plus get my own work done, plus help cover for those on my team struggling at home. So one thing that we saw in our study and other studies as well is that managers have been really hard hit. And so in this case, we have a manager stating this, and they have some people on their team that are struggling, and so they want to reduce their workload, and they're taking it upon themselves to do that extra work. Second quote here, I'm so bogged down in administrative and tactical work coupled with ceaseless meetings, I can't see straight. And the third one saying, staying up too late because I overpromised for what I could get done in April and uh, the end of the month is near. Also the world, I guess. Uh, in the early spring when this was this quote happened, we had a lot of issues in the world. So not only COVID, but here in America where this person was, there was also societal unrest and riots in the street as we've actually seen recently again in America. And so there was just a lot going on. And that's one of the things we need to remember that this isn't necessarily a study of working from home. This is looking at working from home during a pandemic, trying to get work done during a global pandemic. 
some of the answers to what was most challenging that got quoted as mental and physical health can be seen here. Someone said, I want to look at the news. My work feels so trivial compared to what the world is facing. And then this very last quotation. Um, so what was the most challenging part of your day? They said, the moment when everyone was quiet in the calling out for positives in work from home in team meeting. So that's really hard. You know, no one in their team even said anything when they asked what was positive. So some people were really struggling and just not feeling like anything was going right. So what did we do with all this information? You know, it's one thing to collect people's challenges, but obviously we wanted to help people. So we made three changes within the organization. The first was we instituted mandatory meetings starting five minutes after the hour for half an hour meetings and 10 minutes after the hour for any 60 minute meetings. Now, one of the reasons we did this after the, um, the start is because if you try to end a meeting early and the conversation is going, it's nearly impossible to end that meeting early. However, if you say that it's going to start five minutes after the hour and anyone key to the meeting isn't there yet, it's really hard to start a meeting early. People who show up on time get a chance to talk socially and people have that buffer if they need to take it. Now, when we were physically present in the office, thanks to very well-designed buildings, in between meetings, we had to actually walk through conference rooms and we had to go through areas that had bathrooms and water fountains and areas to get a coffee. And so people got a break. But when this started with Teams meetings, we had back to back meetings and there was literally no reason to even move in between them. You just had to click a button. And so instituting this allowed people to, at the very least, take care of their biological needs in between meetings. We also instituted more manager check ins. We asked people to check in more often with their team. One internal study had found that managers who helped their teams prioritize were two and a half times more likely to have people who felt productive during the pandemic. And lastly, we did no meeting Friday. We did this in an iterative process. We used the survey bonus question to check in and see how the first one went, and then we made changes. One thing we found was that no meeting Friday meant huge meeting Monday and Thursday. And so as the pandemic progressed, we had new research on how to do work asynchronously to reduce the overall burden of meetings. And then we instituted weekly no meeting Friday once people understood how to just get rid of those meetings altogether and not push them to other days. We wanted to see how these challenges impacted people. As you can see, no meeting Friday was very positive. The initial negative results were because of this high number of meetings on Mondays and Thursdays, which we think we've largely taken care of with our training on how to to move work to an asynchronous way of collaborating. For additional manager check-ins, people who had this found it to be positive, but there was a large number for whom it was neutral or not applicable, and we saw in the verbatims that not every manager was able to actually provide this. Lastly, starting our meetings late was also largely positive, very positive, um, with a small amount of people who found that it had a negative impact. This ability to automatically start meetings five or 10 minutes late is actually rolling out now in Outlook and so should be out to the general public in the near future. Now, luckily, not everything was actually bad. There were things to be grateful for and we wanted to learn about those. When we asked people what they were grateful for in their day, early on, family and flexibility were the number one things reported. People said things like, I was able to walk the dog while I had a build going and I was able to do some chores while listening in on an all hands meeting. While this could be negative for some people's work-life balance, that intermixing, for others, it was a great way to get things done during work. And then, of course, people here at the bottom saying, more time with my daughters and wife, spending more time with family, able to still work despite being at home. We also saw some gratitudes change over time. For instance, at the beginning, commute, people were really grateful to not have a commute anymore. And that changed by week uh, seven, eight. I'm not sure if people forgot the horrors of the commute or if they just started to realize how many other things there were to be grateful for during this time. Also, work as a gratitude increased. This isn't the ability to work from home, but things actually related to your job, like fixing a really tricky bug or finally checking in something you'd been working on for a long time. And so people started reporting that they were just grateful for the work they got to do. And lastly, we had to add a new code starting near the end of mental health. People were reporting that they were grateful for things like their therapy appointment. And so things along that nature got coded as mental health. Some specific gratitudes that were recorded as mental health are things like mindfulness week and the resources for mental health. I listened to a keynote, participated in a mindfulness activity, and it helped me feel more calm and in control of my negative emotions. Someone else said, I'm most grateful for being here, being heard and having meaningful work to do. Other people were thankful for Microsoft benefits, like the 12 free therapy sessions 
or the pandemic school closure child care leave, which allowed 12 weeks of paid leave for people whose children were home due to schools being closed from the pandemic. Now we wanted to understand the impact of the study. One we wanted to understand was were there certain challenges or gratitudes that were more likely to be related to having a satisfaction in your workday. But we also wanted to see how just being in the study impacted people. What we saw was that people who reported focus and work as a gratitude were more likely to report being satisfied in their day and people who didn't report a gratitude. And remember, this was a required field. And so this meant they actually typed none for their gratitude. They were less likely to report being satisfied as well. People who reported some kind of meaningful connection. So an interaction with another human, whether in person or digitally, were more likely to be satisfied. And we found that 49% of respondents said reporting a gratitude, just the act of doing this, positively impacted their satisfaction during this period. So what was the impact of the study on individuals? Well, after 10 weeks, we did a follow up where we asked people these questions. We asked people to rank whether the daily reflection increased their feelings of control during uncertain times. As you can see, more than 30% of people positively felt that this had helped them with their feelings during uncertain times. We also had people say whether the daily gratitude reflection impacted their well being. And in this case, almost 50% of people said it positively impacted their well being, with the vast majority, the, the rest of the people mostly saying just neutral. And lastly, we asked the daily gratitude reflections impacted my satisfaction with the workday. And again, almost half the people said that it positively impacted their satisfaction with their workday, with very few reporting any kind of negative impact. Here are some verbatims about the impact of, on individuals from the study. I love this one. This is yet another way that the organization has been absolutely amazing throughout this experience. This is the only time I've ever felt like our leadership really genuinely cares about the people in the org. Before they said it, but through this study, they have really shown it. And another says, thank you for taking the time to set up and run this study and to present results to management. I'm grateful for having a job at a company where management takes these seriously and does a lot to improve employee situations. The study has been a place where I feel I can honestly express what didn't go well during the day and what I was happy about. This isn't something I think I can do in my work group. One thing we did with the study was we analyzed the results every week, and then we would share out anonymized versions of these results with the people in the study and with the leadership. This allowed people to understand how others were feeling. This last verbatim says, this has been a great outlet to report how I'm feeling and then hear how others are feeling. It's great to hear I'm not alone with my frustrations and struggles. Thank you. So in those weekly report outs, people could see, oh, I'm not the only one who's finding this overwhelming or feeling like I'm drowning. And then the leadership didn't just see, you know, activity metrics and numbers. They got to really understand how their individual employees were feeling and see some of these anonymized verbatims. And so a lot of people felt like our organization was listening to them and they saw how they were reacting based on what they heard and it made them feel more connected to the org. So now what about productivity? Because I said at the beginning that every company wanted to know, can we do this long term? Well, it turns out that productivity is actually a lot more difficult to um, measure than you might think. And in fact, myself, along with this incredible co-authors recently published the space of developer productivity. There's more to it than you think. And so this study was more interested in satisfaction, which we know is related to productivity and well-being. However, we did see that traditional measures of developer activity, such as number of PRs, was fairly consistent this year as it was last year. So overall, we found that daily reflection on gratitude had a positive impact on the feelings of well-being and overall satisfaction during the work from home period. We also learned that some of the challenges being reported could actually be remedied by organizational changes. And lastly, we know that challenges and gratitude are changing over time, both during this work from home period and more likely in the upcoming hybrid time. And it's very important that we listen to our, our employees and learn these and then communicate those back to management. Overall, I'd really like to thank all of my contributors and of course my co-author Sonia Jaffe, and thank you all for listening to my presentation. Have a great time at the conference. Thank you. Okay, so. Backstage, eight seconds.
So we're live and thank you so much, Jenna, for this wonderful talk and video. I think it was a very excellent uh, video learning a lot about the situation most of us are in, in this pandemic. And I actually could consider working at Microsoft after this. So my question is uh, to you, of course, you're still continuing with this study, if I understand, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, we are. We, we're at month 15, I believe, and we have about 10,000 records now. Um, people, we still get between 50 and 100 diaries every week, so definitely still continuing. I've tried to shut, out, shut it off multiple times. I've asked people, hey, do you want me to stop this? And they're like, no. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so still reading them. And it's yeah. really neat, you know, because we had the, the usernames and so we can track people over time and actually do like a longitudinal study and see how their life has changed. Um, so that's been super interesting. Although at this point, the data seems less representative, I think, because I'm guessing we have a bit of a selection bias that people who are still in it are maybe having a harder time and really need this outlet. So the proportions yeah. have kind of shifted. Okay, so what would you say is the major uh, learning through this process for you? It's not very software engineering e, but I think the major learning is that people really need an outlet, especially during these mm -hmm. times. Like just the act, you know, what, what we saw in the study when we did the follow-up questions was the act of doing it itself was probably the most valuable. So although our management and organization really appreciated understanding challenges and did make changes, and it actually influenced thought leadership throughout the company, um, the individual people are better and more productive because they are getting to share how they're feeling and they know someone's reading it. So that was the other piece. We considered doing some kind of auto um, coding with AI and machine learning and 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 that kind of took away what people wanted like they like knowing that a human is here okay. the way they are and so that was kind of an interesting sweet finding I guess yeah okay so at my, at my company uh, all my managers schedule like half an hour meetings with every person yep so they really get to chat with a human you know mm -hmm. how are you Yes. So is that something you do as well? Oh, yes. We have one-on-ones. And one of the things yeah. that came from the study was to increase the frequency of one-on-ones. Yeah. A separate study found that um, people who had regular help with prioritization were up to two and a half times more productive and more likely to, to maintain their work-life balance, actually, it was. So we do that. But I think the anonymity and not talking to your manager is is just a different way of, of getting out what you want to say. Like, I think there's a lot of things in the diary that people maybe wouldn't, wouldn't say to their boss. So, yeah. So we have an audience here. And if you have any questions, just post them in the chat and uh, and we will read them. So it's it's an open floor. Please feel free. <laughs> so what else can I ask you? Um, so what was the hardest part of this research for you? Um, logistically, the hardest part was just reading them all because I'm the only coder and I don't code a selection. I do read every single one because that was important to the study was that people knew mm -hmm. they were being heard. So that has taken up an inordinate amount of time. And then on the other side, we have seen some diary entries that are very hard, people who are really struggling. And I've had to wrestle with, you know, do I loop in HR? Do I try to reach back out? It's anonymous, but I could build a system that could connect me back to the person without understanding who they are. Yeah. Um, should I do that? There's been a lot of ethical questions around okay. what, what do I do? I didn't, you know, when we launched it, we literally thought it would be two weeks and it would just be understanding how work from home is. Yeah. We didn't realize that it would go on for so long and, and that there'd be riots in the streets and, and that there, all these things would come up. And yeah. so there's been, yeah, America's had kind of an interesting year. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Well, anyway, I, it's only 25 seconds and you can, of course, go and ask uh, Jenna in the backstage, you know, you're click the button there, discussion on the right uh, that will pop up. But thank you so much, Jen.